I'm going to talk about an algorithm for finding the shortest path between two vertices on a graph. The so-called A star pathfinding algorithm. It's an enhancement of Dijkstra's algorithm, but potentially more efficient. Dijkstra's algorithm will find the shortest path from a given vertex to all of the other vertices in a graph. But this may be more information than we need, and therefore more work than we need to do. If all we're interested in is the shortest path between two particular vertices, then the A star algorithm is a better choice. The A star algorithm and its numerous variations is widely used in games programming, natural language processing, financial trading systems, town planning and even space exploration. Before we look at the A star algorithm in action, let's first consider our graph. It might, for example, represent a magical maze, or the rooms and corridors of a haunted house in some sort of adventure game. Perhaps there are secret doorways or portals that you have to pass through as you move around. And because of the walls, there are only certain ways you can go. The weightings of the edges in our graph might represent the number of steps you have to take to get from one door to the next. Whatever you imagine, Behind the scenes, this is what our pathfinding algorithm will see, the vertices and edges of an undirected, weighted graph. The information you can see here is of course crucial, but it's not enough for A star to work. The A star algorithm depends on so-called heuristic estimates. A heuristic estimate is basically an educated guess. Each time we move from one vertex to another, we need an estimate of the remaining distance to the destination. This will inform our next move. Now this can't be just a wild guess. The A star algorithm might not work efficiently if we seriously underestimate the remaining distance. And it might not work at all if we overestimate it. We say that our heuristic should be admissible. This means we need some extra information about each vertex, so we can calculate these estimates. In a system where the vertices are geographical locations on a map, and the edges are distances in kilometres, for example, we might know the longitude and latitude of each vertex, so we can calculate the straight line distance from any location to the destination. With our magical maze, we're going to need a different approach. One way is to use grid coordinates to describe the location of each vertex. If we were implementing this with an object-oriented approach, then each vertex could store its own x and y coordinates. So, suppose we wanted to estimate the remaining distance from E to P. Ignoring any obstacles, yes, ignoring any obstacles, we could move 12 steps to the right and then 4 steps upwards. If we wanted to, we could then use Pythagoras' theorem to calculate the Euclidean distance, that is, the straight line distance between E and P. Alternatively, we could simply use the total number of steps, namely 12 plus 4, which is 16. This is, after all, just an estimate. On a grid system like this, this is known as the Manhattan distance. If you've ever been to New York in the USA, you'll know that the streets are laid out in strict rectangular blocks, and getting from one place to another is pretty much like this. So now we know what kind of information we need, let's walk through an A-star pathfinding problem. We want to find the shortest path from A to P. We'll use a table to record the results of our calculations. The heuristic distance from each vertex to the destination, that is, the so-called h-value, has been pre-calculated based on information that we already have. We've used the grid coordinates of each vertex to calculate its Manhattan distance to p. These h-values have been calculated in advance, but the truth is they don't need to be. If things go well, we're not going to need all of them so it's possible that a program would calculate them as and when it needs them. We're going to maintain two lists, one of open vertices and one of closed vertices. We add our starting vertex A 
to the list of open vertices. Then A becomes the current vertex. And now we need to calculate its G value. The G value of a vertex is the distance we've travelled from the start to get to it. The distance of A from A is obviously zero. The G value for A is then added to the heuristic distance from A to P. And this gives us an F value of 0 plus 16, that is 16. Now we add any vertices that are adjacent to the current vertex to the list of open vertices, in this case B and C. And we calculate their F values by adding their distances from A to their H values. We also make a note of the vertex that we came through to get to each of these in the previous vertex column. Now we can add vertex A to the list of closed vertices. Our next job is to select a new current vertex from the list of open vertices. The most promising one is the one with the lowest F value. We can see from the table that in this case it's vertex C. So C becomes the new current vertex. Now we add the vertices connected directly to C to the open list. We need their F values. These open vertices are known as the fringe or the frontier. One of these will become the successor to C. One of these will become the next current vertex. One vertex at a time, we calculate its G value followed by its F value. Each G value is the G value of the current vertex, which we can read straight from the table, plus the extra distance to the potential successor. Notice that we calculate a new G value for B, even though it already has one. It too is a potential successor for C. For all we know, it may be quicker to get from A to B via C, rather than by taking the direct route. You can see here though that the alternative F value for B is bigger than the previous one, so it doesn't appear to be a better path to explore. The alternative F value for B is therefore ignored. Now we can close C and choose its successor. B is the open vertex with the smallest F value, so B becomes the new current vertex. There's only one vertex connected to B that isn't already open, and that's D. So we recalculate the F value of D. As before, to get the new G value of D for this calculation, we use the G value of the current vertex B, which is 5, plus the extra distance from the current vertex to D, which is 3. Therefore, vertex D has a recalculated F value of 8 plus 16, which is 24. This is better than the one we already have in the table, so we can replace vertex D's existing values with the new ones. Now we can close B. Of the open vertices, H and D both have the same lowest F value, 24, so either one of these could become the next current vertex. For no particular reason, we'll choose H to be the new current vertex. We open and examine the potential successors to H, that is, its adjacent vertices. Two of them are already open, but we still need to recalculate their F values. Using the G value of H from the table, which is the length of the path that we've already established, we determine the G values of its neighbours, and from those we calculate their F values. The new F values for D and E are no smaller than the F values we already have, so we can discard them. And now we can close H. D now has the smallest F value, so this becomes the new current vertex. We open M, L and K. We calculate their F values from their G and H values. And we close D. Now I has the lowest F value, so I becomes the new current vertex. There's only one extra vertex to open this time, and that's J. We calculate J's F value and close I. 
Now at this stage, we could choose any one of four vertices to be the next current vertex. They all have the same f value. We can see from the pattern of red vertices on the graph how the frontier has expanded so far. The next decision will either expand it further or get us to where we want to be. For no particular reason, let's choose J to be the next current vertex. There are two vertices to open, and one of them is our destination, P, the one with the lowest F value. So we found the shortest path. Our search is over. Notice that we didn't need to visit every single vertex in the graph. You can imagine, with a much bigger graph, with a lot more vertices involved, there'd be a much larger proportion of unopened vertices. And that's the beauty of the A-star algorithm. It doesn't have to visit every vertex in the graph. The g-value of p gives us the path distance we're looking for. And, since every vertex has a record of the vertex that came before it, we can now trace these backwards to get the path sequence that we've been looking for. We got to p via j. We got to j via i. We got to i via h. And to h via C. We got to C via A. That's our path. But there's another path in this graph which also has a distance of 28 that we might have found instead. You might remember at an early stage in the process we had to choose which of D or H should be the next current vertex. We arbitrarily chose vertex H and that influenced the course of events that followed. In fact, we had another arbitrary choice to make near the end of the process when we decided to make J current, and arguably we got lucky. A different choice would have slowed things down for sure. This tells us something important about A star. It's guaranteed to find a path if a path exists, but how quickly it does so depends to some extent on chance, but very much on the quality of our heuristics. Ideally, the heuristic estimates of the remaining distances should be as close as possible to the actual remaining distances, but not greater. If these estimates are too small, the frontier will expand unnecessarily, and more time will be spent barking up the wrong tree, as it were. In fact, if the heuristics were all zero, every vertex in the graph would have been explored which is exactly what Dijkstra's algorithm does. If the heuristics are overestimated, on the other hand, A star will find a path if it exists, but it may not be the shortest path. Of course, calculating the best possible heuristics is easier said than done. Our maze had walls. But what if it had features like interdimensional gateways, deadly swamps, fiery lava pits or teleporters? then the costs of the edges of the graph would bear little relationship to physical space. Using Manhattan distances as the basis for our heuristic makes no sense at all. The choice of heuristic depends very much on the nature of the problem. Let's look at some pseudocode. We begin by setting up the open and closed lists. Then the starting vertex is made current. The starting vertex is a special case, so it's processed outside of the main loop. Its h value is calculated, followed by its f value. Then the main loop comes into play. It will run until the destination is found, that is, until the destination becomes the current vertex. Inside the main loop, another loop deals with some of the current vertex's potential successors, its neighbours which are not yet closed. As each neighbour is visited, it's added to the open list and its g, h and f values are calculated. Here, the h values are being calculated on a need-to-know basis. For some applications, it makes more sense to calculate them all up front. The f values of the current vertex's neighbours are then updated. If there's already an f value and the new one is smaller, the existing f value is replaced. At this stage, the parent of each neighbour is also set to be the current vertex, which keeps track of the path. When each pass of the inner loop comes to an end, 
the current vertex is closed and the new current vertex is selected from all of the open vertices, namely the one with the lowest F value. The outer loop repeats to process each current vertex in the same way. Once the outer loop has run its course, the program has generated all of the information we need. The path distance will be the G value of the current vertex and we can trace back through its parents to derive the path that was followed. I'll talk you through a vb.net implementation of this in a later video. To summarise then, the A star pathfinding algorithm has a wide range of applications. The A star algorithm finds the shortest path between two vertices. A star doesn't have to visit all of the vertices, ideally. A star picks the most promising looking node next. The better the heuristic, that's the H value, the quicker that A star will find the path it's looking for. But calculating an admissible heuristic is problematic. The open nodes are known as the fringe or the frontier. Ideally, this shouldn't expand too much. The list of open nodes can be implemented as a priority queue. This can be a significant enhancement because remember, we need to select the one with the lowest F value. If they're in some sort of order, that can help. Each node on the path keeps track of the one that came before it. And A star will always find a solution if one exists.